God in prayer for a second. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, thank you for this day. God, Lord, thank you for this beautiful Sunday morning. God, Lord, thank you because everybody here got here safely. God, Lord, I pray that we have reverence in our heart, God, just awe in our heart, fear in our heart as we sing this next song, God. Um, Lord, just please bless us with humility, God, Lord. There's so many temptations that can happen anywhere, God, Lord. I pray that we can just resist temptations and just set our eyes on you god no matter what happened this week no matter what we have going on after church or in the future god this next week god i pray that we can just take a deep breath and just sing our hearts out for you with joy god and gladness lord thank you so much for everything in jesus name we pray amen Oh, day long, you 
speak through me when I speak. And just like a tree planted by a stream, let's be for a dream of your love. I can face a day without some time to pray. Sing this song to say. For my shame, how can I thank you? Your love paid my way. All that I can do is live for you every day. And just like a dream, planted by a stream, thirsty for a dream of your love. Man, you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Hey, man. Well, good morning, church. As you guys heard, my name is Fernando. <laughs> um, you know, last week we kicked off a new series called Crossing Over, and James did a phenomenal job just opening up that series for us. Um, he, if you didn't get a chance to listen to it, I encourage you to go back and hear that, hear that, um, that, that sermon that he did. Uh, and we're just going to continue along. And what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about kind of a heavy topic, and that topic is that of false doctrines. And we're going to do that through the lens of John chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well. And a little bit about myself, for those who don't know me, I, I've been a disciple of Christ. Come June, it'll be 24 years. And praise God for that. <laughs> praise God for that. And, <clears throat> and um, you know, just this last August, I wrapped up my, my master's in theological studies. Um, that was a huge accomplishment, a huge step along the way. Um, and my dream, my goal is to pursue the doctorate. I want to do a doctorate in theology and continue my studies along that path. And I share this to make sure that I emphasize that I myself am in, I'm not infallible, yeah. right? I make mistakes. I've studied things out, but I'm still prone to error because I'm human. Yeah. Amen? But I share it also to say that I've tried to take seriously my study and learning these things out. That I don't come to this loosely and, and, and just trying to come before you and be like, just hear all these false doctrines out here. What is wrong with these people believing these things? But as someone who's really trying to seek the truth. And what I hope that we'll do today is that we can seek truth together. 
And that's really my encouragement throughout this whole lesson is that we can seek truth together. So we start over in John chapter 4. I'm going to read this story here, beginning in verse 1, where it says, Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had gone, uh, now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And just a quick note here. Literally, um, the Samaritans were a group of people who were a mixture of both Jewish ancestry and just a whole mix of other people. And so the Jewish people viewed the Samaritans as unclean, and they rejected them. So a lot of this subtext in here, the, 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 the kind of notes that are provided, is to help us to see the context that here this Jewish man comes in here, they don't, the Jews don't interact with the Samaritans. They consider them unclean. And so she's surprised that he's talking to her. <clears throat> and so we pick up in verse 10. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see you're a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now let's pause here for a moment. So, it's such a fascinating interaction that's going on here. What I love about it is that, right, Jesus is talking on a spiritual plane and the woman is completely understanding it on an earthly level. And so she thinks they're talking about water. He's talking about something eternal, right? And so, so they're talking, they're kind of talking past each other a little bit, but I believe Jesus is doing this purposefully to get across, or using an earthly example to get across a spiritual reality. And, and it gets to this point where he's like, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst again. And she's like, well, that would be convenient. I would never have to come up to this well. That sounds really helpful. But see, here's the spiritual reality that underlies all of this and the thing that Jesus comes to bring out is that Jesus is saying, look, you here, you have been going to the wrong well for your source of nourishment. The truth of the matter is, is that there is a thirst, this unquenchable thirst that each and every single one of us have. And that, that thirst, we know that it can be satisfied, but we just don't know how to satisfy it. At some point in our lives, we felt that there has to be something more beyond us. We felt that we've sensed it to be true, that there's a longing I have that is just not fulfilled in what I see here on earth. But when we can't find it, what do we do? We look into our sinfulness. And that sin that we commit, it gives us a momentary satisfaction that feels like it fulfills. And so we keep going back to that well those dirty waters. And the more we go to them, the less satisfied we feel. 
And so we have to climb further into these crevices, these deeper, darker places to find just a morsel of satisfaction. And here, <clears throat> excuse me, here, Jesus is bringing to light. He's saying, look, you, you've been going to a well that isn't satisfying you. You have had five husbands. The man you're with now is not your husband. You have been looking to these relationships to satisfy you. It's not working. But the waters I draw from will satisfy you so that you never have to go back again. What you are looking for is found in me. See, and that's the beautiful aspect of this interaction is that he's leading her to exactly what she's looking for. He's providing the answer for her deepest longings, which are found in him. But what's funny, and it's such a human, it's such a human response, it's funny how she reacts, right? He exposes this about her. And then what does she do? She jumps to the theological question. She's like, you Jews say we must worship in Jerusalem. We say you worship on this mountain. Which one is it? Prophet? It's like, that seems like an odd way to respond to having your life exposed. <laughs> but it's actually a very human thing to do, right? When you feel exposed, it's like, well, uh, you know, I need to wiggle out of this somehow. When we feel exposed, when God is trying to draw out our sin, what do we do? We can oftentimes put up these theological questions as our point of contention. When we have to let go of something, when we have to sacrifice, we all of a sudden are like, well, I don't, I don't know about baptism. And it's like we're dodging what God is trying to do in our lives by putting up these debates, these questions that are really a bit of a smokescreen. But I love what Jesus does. He says in verse 21, it says, Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. And then over in verse uh, 28, we pick up, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? What I love about Jesus is that, well, he first answers her question, right? And then she turns around and she becomes an evangelist for Jesus. She goes into the city. She's like, I think the Messiah's here, guys. I think he's out here. And what's fascinating is that she doesn't go into the city. She doesn't say, hey, come find a man who answered all my theological questions. Instead, she says, come see this man who revealed what was true about my life. That was what mattered to her. That was what was more important to her in that moment. And you see, his response to her, he says, look, the type of worshipers the Father seeks are those who worship in spirit and in truth. That is the type of worshiper the Father is seeking. It's not about the location of where we worship, but that we worship in the Holy Spirit and that we worship in truth, that we love the truth. Jesus himself says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. To love the truth is to love Christ himself. And it elevates that for us. It's saying to us, we need to be those who love the truth, who seek the truth. And you see, Jesus is constantly trying to reveal what's true about us, what's true about our position before God, what's true about salvation. I have not been keeping up with my slides. Thank you. <laughs> and also, thank you for whoever brought me water. I didn't see when you did it. Well done. <laughs> Ninja, angel of the Lord just dropped it off right there. <laughs> Appreciate the miracles this morning. 
But you see, what I see in this story as well is that you know, this woman could have very well, if she wanted to, she could have found a reason to reject what Jesus was saying. You know, he says to her something very interesting that she had to accept that was true. He told her that, look, you Samaritans worship what you don't know. He was basically saying to her that everything you believe to be true, you really don't know. It's not right. You don't have the right understanding. And she could have very easily been like, yeah, you know, typical Jewish guy, you're just trying to be condescending, you're always rejecting us, you're always, you're always saying that we're, we're, we're the half-breeds, you're negative against us, you're just like the rest of them, I reject you, I'm out of here. That could have been her reaction. If she wanted to use it, she wanted to use that as a pretense, she could have. But instead, she allows the truth of what he's saying to land on her heart. And she turns around and goes into the city and is like, look, I think the Messiah is here. And that's the thing is that there's always something that can crop up to keep us from seeing Jesus. And the reason for that is that it's not just that we are interacting with Jesus alone, but that there is another entity in play. And that is the enemy. That is Satan. You know, Jesus tells us that the enemy, Satan, that he was a liar from the beginning. That when he lies, he speaks his native language. It also tells us that, that uh, uh, Paul tells us that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. What does that mean? That means that in circles of believers... Satan can be moving through, planting his lies and concealing it as if he's an angel of light, as if it's a message of righteousness. Isn't that, it's, it's so conniving. And we have to be on the lookout. And that's why Jesus says to, to judge by the fruit, right? by their fruits you will recognize them, right? You know, and there's a shocking scripture from Matthew 7, verse 21, that says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Guys, think about this. There, there are, he's saying that there are going to be people out there who believe that they are sealed in Christ, who believe in Christ, who are following Christ, who he will say plainly, I never knew. Who can deceive us so completely that we are performing miracles and yet know the very will of God? That's the type of enemy that we are up against. And we have to take him seriously. That's why we need to love the truth above our own opinions, above our own feelings, above, above anything we've, we've, we've been brought up with. We have to place it above. We have to love the truth. I want to highlight a few errors that we see from the time of Jesus, even before then, that persist all the way down to this day. And I want to show you these origins here. The first error I want to show you guys is placing man's teaching over Scripture. In Matthew 15, turn with me there, Matthew 15, verse 2. It reads, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. This is the Pharisees. The Pharisees are coming at Jesus. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. The fact of the matter is, is that human teachings can be placed above God's word 
and gain prominence in our life. In the time of Jesus, what was going on here is that Scripture says to honor your father and mother. And the way that this was understood and practiced is that when your parents got older, you took care of them. You provided financial support for them. And suddenly, along the way, this new teaching was brought about that said, you know what, actually, instead of using your money to take care of your parents, just give it to the temple. And if you give it to the temple, it's the same thing as taking care of your parents. And therefore, you don't have to honor your father and mother. And Jesus is saying this nullifies God's word for the sake of man's teaching. You're sacrificing God's word for the sake of man's teaching. And you know what? I'm going to highlight a couple things where I believe this is happening today. It's popular in Christianity today. Now, this is what's going to happen, right? This is what's going to happen. I'm going to say these things. And if you agree with me, you're going to say, amen, yeah, that's true. And if you disagree with me, you're going to be like, that's a false teacher. He's a heretic. I'm going to leave this church. I'll never come back again. <laughs> because this is what's in play, right? What happens is that when we've been brought up and we, we, learn, we learn a lot of things in our upbringing, we're brought up, we're taught something, it becomes our worldview. It becomes our perspective. And that perspective, it's almost like a map by which we understand how the world works. And so someone comes along the way and is like, yeah, your map is wrong. We're like, you're wrong. Of course my map is right. That's, I've gotten this far with it. It's never led me astray up until now. So how, how are you telling me that I'm wrong? You have to be wrong. And so we defend. Our natural inclination is to defend whatever we already hold to and, and believe in. Right? And, and, and a part of it is that if we admit that our map is wrong, that's really unsettling. It's like our world's going to be flipped upside down if, if we accept that something could be wrong about what we believe. And yet, if we love truth, we have to even elevate God's truth above that discomfort. We have to be willing to be unsettled so that we can accept the word that is coming into us. You know how deep this, this impulse is to defend? I'm going to give you guys an example. You guys know what this is? Yeah. Planets of our solar system, right? It might be a little hard to see, but what we have is Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Thank you. Now, does something seem missing in this picture? Is, well, yeah. Say it louder, say it louder. It used to include Pluto. There used to be a planet called Pluto. Yeah. It was way out at the end. Yeah. It was tiny, it was really cold. When I was growing up, it was understood there were nine planets in the solar system. And there was one called Pluto. Then in 2006, astronomers came up and said, Pluto's no longer a planet. And you know what we did? Well, we collectively gathered all the information. We considered the facts, understood the research, and said, you know what? Yeah, you know what? That's not a planet. No! That's not what we did. We lost our minds. We're like, why are you trying to take away Pluto? What's wrong with you people? Clearly, you guys are wicked teachers, false prophets away from us. We didn't want to hear it. Even me, when I first heard it, I was like, what's wrong with these people? Why are they lying for no reason? And yet, if I think about in my own life, what role the planet Pluto plays in my own life, I can't think of any meaningful interaction I've had with the planet Pluto. It's not like I'm like, man, you know what? All these conversations I had about Pluto, that's, it's like it's, it was for nothing. You know? It, it's not like it played a role in my day-to-day -day life. It's not like I've stood out there looking at the stars like, you know, Somewhere out there. <laughs> Pluto. It's never been a thought. And yet, when it was taken away, I suddenly had this defensive reaction. And not just me, but like collectively as a society, we had this defensive reaction about something that really doesn't matter. So think about the things that really do matter. The things of God, the things of eternity, the things that we hold sacred. 
And what is it? It's that Satan can hide behind that. He can keep us in error just by this, by this interaction here. And so this is what I want to propose. Instead of saying, I disagree with you, you're a false teacher, you're a heretic, I'll leave here and never come back again. This is what I want you to do instead. I want you to ask the question, why? Like, why do you think that? Right? At least being open to that, to that question, even if you agree with me, why? You know, the Bereans give that example of those who, who listened to Paul's teaching but then went back and confirmed it for themselves. That's what we need to do, is to say, you know what, let's confirm this, let's see. And I'm not going to be able to get into these things very deeply, but I'm, in, I'm highlighting them as places that we can look further for ourselves. And so if you disagree with me, this is what I want you to do. I want you to assume that I am someone who is also seeking for truth. And if I am in error, I want you to correct me. And so I want you to come up to me if you disagree with me. Come up to me after the service. I'll be hovering around here somewhere. I want you to say, you know what? I don't agree with you. I'd love the opportunity to sit down for us to just talk this through. Because together, then, I can show you what I see in Scripture. You can show me what you see in Scripture. And together, we can arrive at that truth. Amen. And that way, speaking the truth in love, we can lead each other. Because ultimately, what matters is that we get what's true. The first two errors I want to mention, and they go hand in hand in, in my mind, a very prominent teaching that is out there today in Christianity that is the sinner's prayer. Praying Jesus into your heart. Now, this has kind of emerged as, as a teaching where, well, you pray Jesus into your heart, and that's how you kind of accept Christ and you, you're saved. And this has kind of emerged at the same time that the doctrine of baptism has been de-emphasized. And the idea is basically like, no, you know, it's, it's a nice to do. If you want to do it, you can do it, but it's not really necessary. You know, you're saved by faith and by God's grace. So you don't need to do that. So one thing has been elevated and another has been de-emphasized. Yet one is found in Scripture and the other is not. And when we look at, when we ask ourselves the question, right, where did the sinner's prayer come from? You know, those who defend it will say, well, it's, it's back in Scripture. But like, no, like, where are the origins? When did this begin? Do we see this all the way back in the early church? Do we see the, the early church practicing this prayer? And the answer is no. You really start to see this emerge 17th, 18th century in America. It's like, okay, so maybe, maybe for 1,700 years of church history, we just got it wrong. And then suddenly in the United States, we were enlightened and we were like, we got it right now. Or maybe we have to accept that perhaps the people who live closer in history, in culture, and in language to the scripture might have understood it better than we do today. Yeah. Or give a little bit of credit to those who came before us. And so... So we see that emerge, we see the sinner's prayer emerge, and then the, the de-emphasis of baptism. You know, I've, I've seen the sinner's prayer, I've seen people use Romans 10 where it talks about, well, you declare, you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and, and, and that's, that's used to defend something like the sinner's prayer. But that only works if you divorce that passage out of the rest of Romans. And that's not how reading works, right? Like, if, if I give you a recipe to make a cake, right, and you're like, step one, flour. Step eight, oven. <laughs> What's going to come out of that? Right? I show up. I'm like, there's, there's fire everywhere. We're putting out the flames. We're, and I'm like, what happened? And you're like, man, you told me to put it in the oven. And I'm like, but what about everything else, steps one through seven? Like, no, 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 but you said put it in the oven. Do we, do we do that with anything else in life? Does that make any sense? And yet with Scripture, it is the case that we oftentimes lift things out, read them in isolation, don't take anything else into account. And while we don't see the sinner's prayer represented in Scripture, we do see Jesus talking about being reborn of water in the Spirit in John chapter 3. We do see 
Romans chapter 6 talk about baptism being our participation in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do see in 1 Peter 3 that it talks about baptism as a symbol, or rather, that the floods of Noah are a symbolic representation of what baptism is. And it tells us that the, the, the waters of Noah's flood symbolize baptism that now saves you also. 1 Peter 3 verse 21 that it's not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what's happened is that, well, you know, we, we had in Christian history the Protestant Reformation, and one of the big teachings from that, and it's scriptural, is that we are not saved by our works. We're saved by God's grace through faith. And I affirm that. I believe that to be true. The issue I have is that today in Christianity, we've decided that baptism, which is singularly a work of God, has, is best viewed as a work of man. That's what's happened, is that we've replaced this work where God is working in us and said, no, 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 this is really just a human work and we're not saved by works, so we don't need it. And again, did... For hundreds of years, did the churches get it wrong? And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, we, we see what's right now. Or is it possible that the early church, the Christians from, who, who are living closer to Jesus' time, understood something differently or better than we did? And I want to be clear here. I don't believe that baptism alone saves. You know, we're going to have a lesson further all along in this series about baptism, and I hope I'm not stealing the thunder of that, that lesson. But, but I don't believe that baptism alone saves. If that was the case, then our ministry should be us standing by a canal. And when someone comes jogging by, we grab them, throw them in the water. We sing, I've been redeemed. And then we run away because they're going to be angry. Right? That would be foolish. <laughs> Just imagining someone coming out of the water like, oh, I'm a Christian now, I guess. Like, <laughs> where do I send my tithe? <clears throat> That's not how it works, because you see, baptism without faith is not baptism. A baptism without repentance is not baptism. A baptism that doesn't come with a commitment and declaration as, of Jesus as Lord is not a baptism. It is not placed in isolation, but it is a part of the fullness and the full picture of God's salvific journey with us. You know, Martin Luther, he was the one who, who, who he pronounced that, that message powerfully, that we are saved by faith, or sorry, saved by grace, uh, through faith, not by works. But even he agreed with the necessity of baptism. You know, and I'll, I'll quote him briefly here, hopefully briefly. Um, in the large catechism, he wrote, in these words you must know in the first place that here stand God's commandment and institution, lest we doubt that baptism is divine, not devised nor invented by men, for as truly as I can say, no man has spun the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer out of his head, but they are revealed and given by God himself. So also I can boast that baptism is no human trifle, but instituted by God himself. Moreover, that it is most solemnly and strictly commanded that we must be baptized or we cannot be saved, lest anyone regard it as a trifling matter like putting on a new red coat. For to be baptized in the name of God is to be baptized not by men, but by God himself. Therefore, although it is performed by human hands, it is nevertheless truly God's own work. And you know, I said before that by the fruits you recognize it. What are the fruits of these two teachings? Well, with the sinner's prayer, I see, and I, I know myself because I walked up to the TV when I was younger and put my hand and said the prayer. What I see is this, is that it creates a situation where people believe that they've accepted Jesus, that they know Jesus, yet know nothing about discipleship, know nothing about obedience, know nothing about walking in the light, know nothing about God's will. And my fear is that these are the people who will come before Jesus and say, Lord, Lord, did we not pray you into our hearts? And he'll say, I didn't know you. I never knew you. And simultaneously, it leads to this stopping people from going to the rebirth of baptism that scripture does talk about. 
And I feel like the fruit is that of nullifying God's word for the teachings of man. I got to speed through these. Here we go. Um, this is what I want to say. If you, I want to repeat this. If you disagree with me, please come talk to me and allow me to show you why I believe these things. And you show me why you believe what you believe. And together we can arrive at the truth. The second error I want to state, the second error I want to state uh, regarding, <laughs> hey, out of the mouth of babes, she's, she's not happy with the false doctrines out here. She's not trying to have false doctrines. <laughs> um, you know, a second error that I see that is quite prominent, that is quite prominent in Christianity today, is simply that of this version of Christianity that doesn't require any holiness. And I feel like this is the type of Christian I interact with the most. You know, when I'm out there, I'm talking to people, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, Jesus, I'm a Christian. I praise Jesus. I was, you know, I, I believe, I have faith. And it's like, great. But then in the same token, you start talking, and they're like, yeah, you know, I got like three, three baby mamas, and I'm on, looking for the fourth one in the club tonight. Yeah. What? Where did you get that from anywhere in here? Right? Or, or might be more loosely, like, yeah, I'm a Christian, praise God. Me, me and my girlfriend are, are both Christians. We live together. Oh, well, you know, these are modern times. We, we live, you know, everyone's doing that. It's just, you know, this is antiquated. We're living, we're living like modern people. What does Jesus say? Wide is the road that leads to destruction. If we're living like the rest of the world, what road do we think we're on? We're called to holiness. And look, this isn't anything new. In Jude, verse 4, it says, For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in among you. They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ, our only sovereign and Lord. What's he saying? He's saying, look, there are people out there who are going to abuse the grace of God. They're going to pervert the grace of God and turn it into a license to just live a sinful life. And imagine that. You can walk out there and be like, yeah, I know Jesus, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, and yet have no change whatsoever. That isn't Christianity. That is not discipleship. That is not denying yourself. And I do agree with those who say that, hey, sanctification is a process. I believe that. But repentance is a decision. And these are two different things. We are constantly being sanctified. But our decision is that we must walk away and repent from sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 reads, If we deliberately keep on sinning, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. We have to take God's word seriously. And we have to love God's word as true. And if maybe you've been in this position, you've lived that way, come know the real God. Come know the real Jesus. Come talk to me as well. If, if you disagree with me, you can talk to me. If you want to know the real God, come talk to me. I'd like to show you from Scripture what I believe God is trying to reveal to you. I want to introduce you to the Jesus of Scripture because we know that if we are not following God in obedience, 2 John 1 tells us, if we're not following God in obedience, we don't know God. The last error I'll mention is legalism. We'll look at Galatians chapter 2. This was around in the time of Jesus. It's around today. It says in verse 1, 
And I'll read this and I'll kind of explain what it's talking about. But it says in verse 1, Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus who was with me was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what he's talking about here is that there was an element within the Christian circles back then that was basically trying to attach them to a legal system, saying you need to go back to the Torah. You need to go back and be circumcised. You need to keep following the regulations of the law. And yet Jesus' ministry was this fulfillment of the law, which brought about a righteousness that is brought forth with faith. And so he was saying, you're not made righteous by how well, how perfectly you can follow these laws. But yet this was a prominent teaching. And so what was happening is that people were going around and people were becoming slaves again to following the rules. And they understood their salvation in relationship to rule following. And as a result, they never felt free. This was exactly what Martin Luther dealt with. He was himself saying that, look, I would sin, so then I'd have to go and I'd, I'd confess it. But then if I forgot about a sin, I'd have to come back and confess that one too. And I would keep confessing, and then in confessing, I'd have to do my penance. And then after I do my penance, then I sin again, and, and I have to go back and confess and do penance. And it was just this endless cycle of trying to get myself saved. That's what he was experiencing. It was like every time he sinned, he was out of God's grace. And every time he repented, he was back in God's grace. And you know, the way that this has played out in our community of churches is that we have, we have fallen into the trap of viewing things in the past like evangelism as the marker of our salvation. That, you know, last week I shared my faith, so I'm good. This week I didn't, so I hope I don't die. But if I go out there and share my faith, then I'm saved again. Right? These are, these are the spirits of error. And what does that produce? It produces a Christianity that lacks the freedom that God talks about in Galatians 5.1. It lacks that experience of the life to the full because we're constantly trapped trying to perform and try to be perfect when we know we can't. You know, I think back on the woman at the well. And this was a woman who allowed Christ to correct her beliefs. He answered her curiosities. He answered her questions. But at the end of the day, he wanted to deal with her, with where she was at. And that's true today. God wants to deal with us where we are at. He wants to deal with what's true about ourselves. And if we will let him, if we will set aside all the, the teachings out there, all, all, the, all the, 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 the obstructions of Satan that have tried to get in our way, if we just say, you know, let me pause all that and just go to Jesus, then I believe that he will give us that eternal life that we so desperately seek. He will fill us up with a water that will well up from within where we will always be satisfied, never thirst, and have eternal life as a result. My family, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Let's love Jesus. Love his way. Love the truth. Love the eternal life that he is granting to us. And with that, let's pray for our communion. Amen. Father in heaven, I thank you so much just for your word and for just constantly guiding us within your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray that we can be seekers of the truth and seekers of Christ always, above anything else, that we can set aside our opinions, set aside what we've learned. Help us to be humble, Dad. Help me to see if I am in error, that I can be corrected and know what is true, that I can know your will so I can live that and receive that, that blessing of being told, well done, good, faithful servant. I pray, Father, for the communion that we know, Dad, that the body that was broken, the blood that was spilled is all represented here. And we take this knowing that what you, the, the grace you gave us 
It came at a cost. I pray that we can remember Jesus in this time. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> Did my husband do an amazing job? <laughs> okay, so I'm Rosie. I'm the wife. Um, <laughs> I'm here to share about the offering, the offering message. So I want to read a scripture found in Matthew 6, verse 19, if you want to turn there with me. And I'm going to read from Matthew 6, verse 19 through 21, and I'm going to tell a little story of what happened recently. <laughs> okay, do not store up, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going through my allergies, so please forgive my voice. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths, where moths and vermins destroy 
and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a story. A few weeks ago, um, I lost something pretty valuable, and um, I lost the diamond on my engagement ring. Okay, so I lost a diamond on my engagement ring. Okay, so um, uh, you probably noticed I do have a ring on now, but that's, uh, I'm gonna save that for the end. That's not it, <laughs> I'm gonna save it for the end. So um, I, I had it on the whole day. I was, you know, I think I was on spring break or something, I was doing a bunch of things in the house. And somewhere along the way, the evening comes and I glance at my finger and I'm like, where is my diamond? Like, what? You know, because this was uh, you know, about, what, more than seven years ago, we, we got engaged, uh, almost eight years ago now. We got engaged, and, and this is a beautiful thing for me. Like, it's, it's a meaningful item, right? I didn't lose my ring, but it was the diamond. So it was like, <laughs> I, I, it was crazy. So I, I was, of course, um, nervous, you know, and, and I'm, I'm going around, and I'm looking for it, and I tell him what's happening, and I... And so we start looking for it, and, and basically, we never found the diamond, okay? Never found the diamond. Um, so I, of course, my heart was kind of broken. I mean, I can't say it was completely broken because I do still have my ring, and yes, I could replace the diamond one day, um, but we're not in a position to do that. <laughs> Probably won't be for a little while, and that's okay. So, um, so I had to kind of sort of grieve through that for a bit, um, and then... I took it off and I said, all right, I'm just gonna wear my, my original band, which is a very thin gold you know, band and it's fine. Um, it was a little weird at first, but anyway, I was, I was wearing it. And, and then after like about a week of wearing it, it just dawned on me like, you know what? Like I actually kind of like, it, it kind of was growing on me, you know? And I said, I don't know why I was so upset that the diamond was lost. I think it's obviously, it does have a meaningful connection, but I didn't really lose the ring itself, so it really wasn't a big deal. But I realized, like, what is more important than this diamond is the real diamond, which is our love, right? The love that we have for each other that God has given, um, given us the privilege to have for one another. And, and, and we committed to, to God, you know? We committed our marriage, we committed... And so that's what's important. And, and so I accepted that, and then I started liking the one little tiny ring even more. And I was just like, okay, cool, I'll accept it. No big deal, awesome. Well, about a week ago, just to give you a little background real quick, my husband is part of a program that if, you know, basically if they send him free stuff, if he reviews it. And so he, you know, he found a diamond ring on this website that does this. And, and he was like, look, I, I, look what I found. And I said, that, no way. So I looked at it, and I'm like, is this a real diamond? Like, there's no way, you know, for free? That's, that's weird. So apparently, yes. I mean, it's lab-grown. It's a lab-grown diamond, but it's a real diamond. <laughs> so I was like, okay, cool. Go, go for it. So a few days um, ago, I got, I got the ring. He put it on me, and I was like, okay, okay. I like it. I like it. This is the ring now, you know. It's a real diamond. <laughs> It's not the same one, but uh, maybe a placeholder, who knows, for a while until we can afford the diamond and put it back on the ring. I don't know. But the truth, the thing is, here's the thing. Um, I realize my treasure is not in a diamond. My treasure it can, should not be, and neither should yours. Um, it, it should be really in heaven. And that's really what, you know, I, I started listening to God's voice and going, you know what, Th what's more important? It is our marriage. It is the marriage that God has allowed us to have together and the bond that we have through God. So that is what's more, most important, and that's what I want to encourage you with today. Thank you. My husband's going to pray. And as the man who forgot to renew the jewelry insurance this year, <laughs> um, I do also want to hold up my wife's grace in this story. <laughs> which is, of course, reflective of God's grace. So let's <laughs> pray to him. Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you just for the things and abundances you've given us. And we pray, Father, that 
in, in no small way that, that we can just turn around and give this back to you. What better place to place it than in your hands? What better place to place our treasure than in heaven? Because as we learned, yeah, the earthly treasures disappear, mm. but the ones that are stored in heaven can never be taken away. I pray that we can reflect on that as we give. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right. How's everybody doing? All right. Awesome. All right. So announcements. I only have one announcement. So just pay close attention. Do I have any marriage in the house? Yeah. All right. So uh, April, we're going to kick off our first of uh, many. It's a series that we're doing. Um, every month, we're going to be having families host them. And I believe our first one are, is the Alejandros, actually. Uh, and that date is, just mark your calendar, it's April 26th, it's a Friday, uh, 7.30, it's going to be right here. So please invite your married friends, I'm thinking even maybe engaged couples, what do you think? I mean, maybe, maybe it could help, I don't know. Get them prepared early. Amen, but please invite your friends that are married, engaged couples, those of us that are veterans or newly, newly married, I'm pretty sure we can learn a lot of things. The title of... What we're going to be talking about is shared spiritual kingdom vision. Okay, shared spiritual kingdom vision. Again, Mar uh, April 26, 730, right here. Thank you. All right, let's stand for our closing song. So 
we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise, is your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only, great are you It's our bread. It's your bread in our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your bread. It's your bread in our lungs. So we pour. 